It's tremendously big and tremendously wet. Everybody and welcome to episode 94 of the Ron and Brian podcast. I'm Ron, as always, joined by the man who usually has to pay good money to get the kind of beating that Mike Bloomberg got last night, Brian. Brian, how are you, my friend? I am doing. Uh, I'm doing. I'm a little confused. I, I this okay. this is a new world that we are living in, not the world that I woke up in yesterday. Yesterday, um, we're recording this just for our listeners, the day after the Democratic debates. I woke up yesterday feeling very confident that Michael R. Bloomberg was going to get my vote for president. We'll get to it a little bit later in this podcast, but right now, I'm not feeling so secure in that vote. Understandably so. Well, you know what you need, Brian? You need yourself a drink. Drink of the week. Drink of the week. Slasher. Drink of the week. Drink of the week. So it was quite a matchup this week. Um, We had another beer. Last week we drank uh, Bitter Monk from Anchorage Brewing. Did not go over so well. Uh, But this week we put up their Medusa Double IPA against Wild Mind Brewing's La Reine. Can you say it like that, Brian? La Reine? No, I'm still a little um, speechless how well you just handled that. Well, a little fun fact. George Takei used to have a dog named La Reine Blanc. And he used to say it, La Reine Blanc. It's one thing I just remember. Speaking of white dogs, did you ever see the after-school special White Dog in the 70s? Uh, I don't believe that I did. It was about a little white girl, I would, uh, probably mid-teenager, and uh, her family adopts a white dog who apparently had been uh, abandoned by a racist family because this black dog, I mean, this white dog hated all of her black neighbors. And it was the story of her um, trying to retrain this dog um, from a world of hate to one of acceptance. All right. and it, we might it have to really hated black people. Like it really <laughs> hated them. Might have to add that to what we're watching later. Much like Michael um, Bloomberg. But regardless, uh, Wild Mind Brewing, La Reine, La fell, Reine. Uh, fell a vote shy. And so we are drinking Anchorage Brewing Medusa Double IPA. I still have to crack mine open here. Brian, did you uh, did you happen to take yours out already? I, pour, I started to pour mine. The first thing I noticed was the hazy, opaque, yellow-orange hue that it gave off. I would say it had a nice uh, white, creamy head at first. To the nose, uh, I picked up some uh, citrus, tropical fruit, a little grassy hops. Oh, very, very um, fruity. But to the taste, I, it, the grassy hops are, are first what you uh, pick up on. Then I would say it follows with the sweet tropical. All right, that was our dev on Beer Advocate. That was really his or her explanation. I have not tried this yet. Did you? I, I did, I'm pouring mine. I have a little too much head. It was a, a bad pour. Why don't you take a sip and give me your impressions, and I'm going to let this uh, this head die down a little bit. Thoughts? Um, it Ooh. Mm. All right, let's talk. Uh, I have my. I, I first, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are, and I'll tell you exactly hmm. what my comments are on this. All right. So it is. Uh, well, it's, I think we can both agree it is better than the bitter monk we had last week, hands down. Um, still, it's a very. Oh, I got to take another sip. Hold on. See the way I would describe it is it tastes like a beer mixed with an orange juice. But they put water to water it down. Like, remember what was it's, what did we call it when when, uh, when you and I and uh, your lovely wife, uh, loyal listener, loyal, uh, uh, you know, just a, basically the third arm of this podcast. Um, when uh, the three of us went out for uh, lunch that day and we ordered the beer with the orange juice, oh, we had the uh, we had the beer mosa. Okay, this tastes like a watered down beer mosa. 
I can see where you get that. It's uh, it's you know you, it it definitely does not. The smell is great. Like you smell it, and you're like, I'm gonna have a very good experience yes. with this beer. And then you taste it, and I would say it's it's average at best. Yeah, it just does not have the. Um, it's not hitting me like I wanted to. So I guess now we're zero for two uh, with Anchorage Brewing, but um, we will put up another poll next week. We've got a few more beers left in the Tavor crate. Um, I'm sure we'll see La Ren back again, or maybe we'll put it up against uh, an appropriate contender for next week. So, Brian, My, any, any parting thoughts on the drink this week? I would like to say one thing I was very happy um, was I'd like that the uh, the listeners really came out to support what we're doing here with our Tavor Presents Drink of the Week. Uh, you know, uh, as the uh, week progressed, we put up the poll. I didn't really think that we... Uh, um, it wasn't up for very long, just maybe about two days or so, and uh, I was happy with the turnout. I was I liked the fact that it was uh, pretty close to a 50-50 split for most of the week. A uh, little disappointed that Loren did not win, but at the same time, I was just happy that it was a fair fight. Um, no issues with the Shadow app, no uh, inconsistencies with a uh, uh, Ukrainian server. It was a fair uh, election. It's something we do not see very much uh, in America anymore. So I was uh, overall, I'm uh, uh, happy with the uh, with the way this thing turned out. All right, awesome. We'll keep an eye out on the Facebook page for the next drink of the week. In the meantime, let's roll on over to this week in racism. This week in racism. 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 So I got to say, it was looking uh, like your prediction was going to be off again. You uh, you, 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 felt that this was the week that Shaheen Borna was uh, going to get knocked off. He was leading most of the week. And then Hans Berglund makes a late charge at the end, really piled up the votes in the last two days, and takes the win 78% to 22%. So Shaheen only managing two wins. He goes to the bench. Hans is our new This Week in Racism champion. Uh, We unfortunately did not have a challenger for him this week. We had a couple of instances of racism, but not that good um, audio quality uh, that we like to see from our contenders. So we're going to give Hans a week off. We're going to check on the racism over the upcoming week. As always, you can send us any racism you see out there through our website, Ron and Brian podcast.com. Brian, your thoughts on Hans win. Not one of our greatest racists of all time. I cannot pretend that uh, this is that I, I see Hans as a first round uh, candidate uh, for our year end racist of the poll. I'm imagining Tavor will present it. We'll see. Um, Hopefully. But what clearly, you know, the audio uh, will, you know, ultimately will trump the uh the written word uh you know the overprivileged uh white male getting into a uh uber uh deciding he should be able to sit where he wants to sit you know the world has just uh, uh become so privileged so entitled that uh hans gruber over here felt that he could go into the nakatami uh, uh tower take whatever he wanted um and uh, yes, I would say Hans uh, Hans Zimmer this week uh, did a very nice uh, soundtrack for uh, the week in racism. Ron, all right. So Hans gets the week off. I mean, again, I, I was very shocked to see uh, that he was behind for most of the week. Uh, but I think again, you know, true racism always rises to the top in this week in racism. So again, thanks to all the folks out there that voted in the this week in racism poll, as well as all those for the drink of the week poll. In the meantime. We've got some beefs. Ron and Brian's Beef of the Week. Still the best bumper of all, in my opinion. In my humble opinion. Well, the idea of combining um, the moos is really what... (laughs) First off, it's a catchy tune. You know you're you're going to enjoy the tune. And then for it to to hit in with, with the with the moo right at the right beats throughout it's it was it was well done. Kudos to producer GZ, DJ Jazzy Jeff for uh, putting that together back in the day uh, on the uh, streets of South Philly. So Brian, what's what's your beef this week? 
My beef this week is New York City's own Penn Station and the homeless problem that it has. Uh, okay. Early, uh, last weekend, I uh, traveled out to New Jersey uh, on a uh, day trip to visit a friend of mine uh, and uh, had to go through Penn Station to take the train uh, out heading west every now and then. I dared across the uh, Hudson River. And I will tell you, the homeless problem in Penn Station is out of control. Uh, there's there's no police presence. Nobody's escorting these people to move on. They are um, uh, panhandling. They are, uh, how do I say this, contributing to uh, a garbage problem. Uh, and there's just lots of people who have set up shop on the floor to lay out and sleep, to uh, 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 sprawl their uh, uh, belongings. Uh, there's got to be a, uh, a solution here. I say it's a homeless shelter. We should be rounding these people up. Uh, and uh, whoa, 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 that sounds aggressive, rounding them up. Well, where would you like to put them, Brian, into cages? No, Ron. Oh, Ron. I'm just, you know. Maybe you you do maybe you do have to put some bars on the windows of these homeless shelters. Maybe you do have to lock the doors at night to prevent them from uh, uh, sneaking out to do drugs. I don't know. I, I don't have the answer here. But I will say All that right. uh, five years ago, the homeless problem in Penn Station was nowhere near as bad as it is. It's getting worse. And my mayor, Bill de Blasio, is still uh, thinking that he should be uh, on the national stage. All right. A um, little bit of trivia I learned this week since you uh, talked about Penn Station. Um, can you tell me what the difference is between a station and a terminal? Oh, yeah. A station is a train stop that uh, trains go into and out of. A terminal is the last stop on a, on a train line. Interesting. I was not aware of that prior to this week. That's because you're from upstate New York where trains are not um, <laughs> uh, as prevalent as New York City. All right. Fair enough. Um, so my beef this week, Brian, I got to throw it out to uh, to Facebook oh. as my beef of the week this oh. week, not for contributing to the degradation of our society, not for contributing to uh, the Russian involvement in our elections, not even because apparently uh, Mark Zuckerberg needs to have his employees uh, air blow dry his uh, sweaty armpits prior to a public appearance. I can overlook all of that. But this week, you know, we, I do some of the social media for the podcast. And, you know, every now and then it'll be like, hey, why don't you spend a few bucks and we'll give you an ad credit. So this week they were like, hey, spend 10 bucks on an ad and we'll give you a $30 ad credit. And I'm like, I'm tripling my money. It's, it's going to I'm going to lose money if I don't spend this money. So I click on it and it pops up and it says, hey, here's a suggested post for you to boost. All right, fine. We'll boost that one click it to boost a couple hours later get a note back we've denied your ad no you're the one who fucking told me to post it i was gonna what? post another one but you said boost this post it's suggested of course they don't tell you why it wasn't you know why it was turned down but it's just like it, it's just it's annoying to me and of course there's no way to like reach out to anyone at facebook like no customer service whatsoever was it the Facebook post where I um, encouraged uh, New York City Police Department to round up the homeless people and shove them in cages? It wasn't like that much I would have understood. And, you know, that one probably would go through. It was it was your Instagram post of just the episode. So I have no idea really? what happened. Maybe uh, maybe they have an issue with our uh, our stance against Chardonnay flavored beers. Oh, well, here's a here's one that uh, here's kind of uh, my backup beef of the week was youtube okay really because it's it's it's, it's the fact that they um uh, they arbitrarily decide which episodes they are not going to uh uh, uh what's the word i'm thinking of spotlight it's not really spotlight right. they won't um, or, they or won't, even list they won't even host any of our uh, for last week they would not um uh post the video the audio of our last podcast which was say no to chardonnay beer uh the week before they were absolutely fine with it and obviously hmm. we know that you know all the kids are listening on youtube that's where the the next generation is getting their entertainment from they're not getting it from uh uh you know uh, scratcher or stitcher or whatnot they're all on youtube that's where the kids want to receive this entertainment and youtube is not letting us uh house our wares it really bothered me 
And yet, Take On Me from AHA just broke 1 billion views on YouTube. So, so you maybe, tell me where the justice is. Maybe it's not just the kids. Uh, maybe not. Take on me. Take on me. Take me on. So we kind of alluded to it at the top of the broadcast, but yes, the Mm. most recent Democratic debate took place in Las Vegas, Nevada last night. Uh, Quite a humdinger. Uh, Mike Bloomberg qualified uh, just a few days prior based on some of his national polling. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that he might not be happy that he uh, he made that debate because he got shellacked. I I think that he knew he was going to be targeted. I think the issue here is not the fact that he was shellacked, but it was the fact that he really performed poorly. He did not defend himself well. He did not have good responses. Um, You know, there were a lot of subjects where I felt that, you know, he, there were the obvious attack points. He is a billionaire who is um, trying to buy his way into the campaign. He is the 1%. He was the mayor in New York City that encouraged uh, the uh, stop and frisk program. You know, uh, what were the other ones? Oh, uh, he's made some uh, uh, some comments during the Me Too movement that haven't gone over, uh, haven't aged like fine wine that I'm sure he has in his uh, collection. But there were a bunch of things where you knew he was going to get he was going to get uh, 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 attacked on. And what bothered me, or I guess disappointed me about his performance, was that he seemed utterly unprepared to act like a leader in those moments. Right. His his argument was that he was the 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 only person on that stage capable of defeating Donald Trump in a general election. And if he had that type of performance in a debate against Donald Trump, Trump would wipe the floor with him. Correct. He, Instead, he, he, that privilege uh, went to Elizabeth Warren, who I think had definitely the best performance in the debate, uh, possibly the best performance in any debate so far. I mean, she came out swinging and struck a, a number of blows, not just on Mike Bloomberg, but on Bernie Sanders, on Mayor Pete, on Amy Klobuchar, um, Biden. I mean, it was she just went up and down the line kicking ass, uh, frightening frightening performance there were so many different dynamics going on all at once that i really got a kick out of the debate because they were recurring um rivalries like bernie sanders was just kind of attacking we're right there well there's uh, hold on i apologize there is somebody at the door which does not usually happen normally during the the recording i know so let me just make sure it's not an emergency of any kind oh shit what brian yeah it's uh it's it's elizabeth warren oh is she on the warpath like yesterday i i I don't know uh senator warren uh how can we help you i've heard that brian lost his virginity to a clown. Ooh. Oh, boy. Wow. Oh, gosh. Listen, listen. This is, uh, you know, we, we if we're going to beat Donald Trump, we can't be pointing fingers at each other. We need to be on the same side. I'm, I mean, Senator Warren, why are you attacking us? Ron watches porn videos and pastes a picture of Brian over the woman's face. Ooh. Once. Once I did that. And how the hell did you even know that? Shh, listen, that's, that's, Liz knows everything. Wow. No one's talking about the NDA that Brian made Ron sign. I I can't comment on that. Brian, would you like to address that one? Of course. You know, non-disclosure agreements are very common in the podcasting world. Um, There is, uh, they are uh, uh, contracts that both parties agree upon. Um, You know, we both prefer to uh, keep the terms of that NDA, the non-disclosure agreement, um, private. And uh, it, it's it's very common. I think I, uh, you know, uh, I, I believe I, I had made a joke that Ron wasn't too happy with, uh, you know, and uh, and we we came to an agreement. I I have no uh, no comment on that, uh, uh, Senator Warren. Anything else? People tell me that Ron cries while watching NBC's This Is Us. Oh, ooh, that is a listen. That is a listen. That is a that is a that is at least half a box of Kleenex. On the baby's blind, Brian. 
the baby was born blind. Oh my God! The God fact that you know you that Liz. reference. God was... damn you! Why won't you stop? If you want me to go away, all you have to do is go to elizabethwarren.com and donate. Fine, Brian. Are you going to send Senator Warren some money? Well, I, I, I would, but first I want to go to Joe three zero zero three three zero. Don't piss her off. We're going to give you money, Senator Warren. Just please, please leave. Bye, bitches. What? A, <sighs> oof, we got off easy. I hate to tell you, with the you know she she literally, um, and I, I don't know whether it was the fact that she was standing next to Bloomberg. But she, within 45 seconds of the debate, had a great opening line, which was that she was going after, you know, a billionaire who, um, you know, uh, who's using his money to buy power, who uh, disrespects women, who calls them, uh, what was it, uh, uh, horse-faced fatties. And I'm not talking about Donald Trump. I'm talking about Mayor Bloomberg. And he had nothing. He just stood there. And and she really when she when she brought up the 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 charges of sexual harassment against him, improper workplace behavior, and the NDAs that he has in place with some employees, I mean he again that you would think you know he would be prepared for that. Like he he has to be aware that that's public knowledge, and you know anybody's going to come after him about that. And he just did not seem to have. A good answer. I mean, the the crowd. You could hear him, him them boo some of the answers he gave regarding that, and and I think what he said that like really, you know, that really, I don't want to say triggered, but maybe maybe pissed people off is when he said, "Oh, these NDAs were consensual," and it's like that's a, a very unfortunate phrase to use when dealing with sexual harassment because yeah. you clearly did something that was not consensual and just the fact that you may have paid somebody off and got them to sign this NDA doesn't take away what you did in the first place. Yeah, I mean the whole idea of a non-disclosure agreement is I don't want anybody to know what took place here and I'm willing to pay you a certain dollar amount to ensure that nobody finds out about it. Just the very concept of that agreement implies that you did something wrong. And Warren, I mean, I thought that it, you could almost sense it was the moment where Bloomberg's campaign cracked. Is it irreparable? I don't know. We'll find out in the long run. But the moment where I felt his campaign just cracked was when she sat there and said, you have the power right now to release anybody that signed the Non-Disclosure Act and let them talk about it. Are you going to do that? And he froze. Right. Bloomberg just froze. He stumbled and he uh, he said no in a way that was unsatisfactory because and ultimately she got him so good in terms of putting him on the spot. And it, what, what she basically did was she placed him not on the stage of the... Um, uh, the, the leftward leaning uh, American citizens, but she put him on the the um, the side of the Harvey Weinstein's, the um, the Donald Trumps, you know the uh, you know the, the the people that have have, have done no good, and, uh, and and Bloomberg just was not able to put together an intelligent defense of his actions. And it wasn't even just the non-disclosures. To me, that was the breaking point. But the, one of the moments where I, I, I felt that he had um, uh, literally just uh, uh, almost abandoned uh, trying to uh, uh, to win this uh, debate was when they started talking about his tax returns and how uh, he hasn't released them yet. Now, to me, the answer of, we, you know, I, I wasn't running until uh, two weeks ago or whatever it was. Um, uh, I, I've, I've uh, you know, instructed my accountants to put it together for releasing to the public. I have nothing to hide and I will be releasing him and everybody will be able to see what I have. That to me was the right answer at that moment. But when he sat there and said, and it was almost as if he was quoting Donald Trump from four years ago, when he said, my tax returns are very complicated. Right. That was there almost a direct. Thousands of pages. Thousands and thousands of pages. Oh, it was like four years ago. And, and, and that was the whole, one of the whole things 
that the Democratic Party was attacking Trump on was his lack of transparency. And then, and this is where I think um, uh, Bloomberg literally, uh, you know, uh, took a, a step away from being in touch with people when he sat there and said, you know, I, I can't just go to TurboTax and, uh, and knock out my return. Well, that's how most people do their taxes. Well, and, and does Michael uh, own some stock in TurboTax? Because that was a very, uh, a very good plug to have right there. Oh, was that really what people were uh, accusing him of? No, I'm just curious myself. It's a good question. Hmm. It was. I was just. I was. Um, also, another dynamic that I found interesting was Pete Buttigieg going up against Amy Klobuchar. And, and I think that was kind of the matchup that was. I think the most confusing to people throughout the night. And you know, I, I think every article I read pretty much you know agreed that Mike Bloomberg had the worst performance. Um, of the debate, but a, a very close second went to Amy Klobuchar, and I don't think I don't think she expected um, Mayor Pete to go after her, and maybe that threw her off her game a little bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you are, it, it also doesn't make sense why you would go after somebody below you in the polls, unless the thought process is. You know, if you can knock off, if you can get the lowest ranked person in the polls to drop out, maybe you pick up, you know, her 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 supporters. Uh, but you're not going to do it in a way where, you know, at one point, you know, she asked him, you know, are, are you insulting me? Are you are you trying to belittle me? But hold on a second. One of the things I picked up on, which I kind of touched upon with uh, Liz Warren and Bloomberg was it almost felt as if. Um, the candidates were going after the people standing next to them. And, and and I wonder if that is not something that their strategists or advisors said makes for, makes for better television when you can see both bodies. Like the order of the stage the way they were standing was, it was Mike Bloomberg all the way on stage left. Then you had um, Liz Warren, you had Bernie Sanders, you had Joe Biden, uh, Mayor Pete, and then you had Amy Klobuchar. Now, Mayor Pete went after Klobuchar. Liz Warren went after um, went after Bloomberg. Bernie and Joe Biden were, the, were 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 kind of going back and forth at times. Like at very like at no point was Klobuchar really going after Bloomberg. No, I mean there there were a couple of times, but for the most part, um, you know the two of them went at each at each other. I think you know Mayor Pete had two. For me, I think very, very powerful lines. Uh, first, in his opening statement, where he mentioned, you know, he, he 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 went after Sanders and Bloomberg, talking about the two people leading in the polls for the Democratic nomination. One wanting to burn down the party, the other trying to buy the party. And mm-hmm. I think that's that's a sound bite that can really potentially get some legs. Um, but then, in in his time of going uh, going against uh, Amy Klobuchar because Amy you know her big thing is talking about winning elections and being electable and everything else and and he said to her you know this is a race for the presidency if winning a race for Senate in Minnesota you know translated directly to becoming president I would have grown up under the presidency of Walter Mondale Mm -hmm. and it was like all right good point good point nobody wanted that Walter Mondale got crushed yes and Amy Klobuchar would get crushed I did not pick up on her having a, ba- a bad debate. Um, I thought she kind of held her own against the uh, the onslaught of uh, Mayor Pete. I felt that she took a lot of hits on the uh, not knowing the name of the president of Mexico, and Which- she tried she tried to deflect it at first because it was a direct question from one of the moderators who was yes. from the Latino community. And I believe it was La Punta Mundial. Um, but uh, the point being is just the fact that it was a direct question, which was um, recently you were asked about uh, Mexico. You were unable to identify the president. Don't you think that somebody running for president should be able to identify the uh, the heads of state of our neighbors? And I thought she did a decent job uh, deflecting it. But then uh, Mayor Pete just crushed her with the you are on the <laughs> Senate committee where you are in charge of coming to terms with ne- uh, uh, trade negotiations with our partners. If you yeah. don't know this guy's name, then whose name do you know? And that's what I think. Was that when she sat there and was the, are you calling me stupid? 
Yeah, I mean, that's that's when she said, are you trying to say I'm dumb? Are you mocking me? But he made an incredibly valid point. Which is why I thought that her defense there was incredibly stupid. Because it was almost as if she was trying to, I felt, she was almost as if she was trying to create a, um, men. Can, uh, it, it's unfair for a man to call a woman uh, out on, on something she doesn't know. You know, but the fact was, this is information that she should know. Right. And I thought it was a very relevant um, uh, comment on him. And the fact that instead of defending herself for saying, I made a mistake, I should have known his name, I knew his name, but I couldn't think of it in that very moment. You know, she just sat there and was like, oh, are, are you calling me dumb? Are you attacking my intelligence? Is it because I'm a woman? And I, I, I just was like, whoa, whoa, why are you pulling that card? Like, this yeah, is a moment to take responsibility, rise above, and show that you're better than other people. And it almost felt like she started to pull the victim card. Well, and, and it was interesting. She she kind of started her defense of herself by saying, you know, I made a mistake, and, and maybe that's what we need in politics again versus the current occupant of the White House. You know, we need someone with the humility to say, yes, I made a mistake, but then goes 180 from that to defending herself to, to Mayor Pete. So I think she started to defend herself in one way and then completely, you know, uh, talked back on herself afterwards. Right. It just, it, it felt weak. Now, Mayor Pete took some hits as far as uh, from experience, you know, Klubashar, you know, in talking about immigration reform, you know, told him you've memorized a bunch of talking points and a bunch of things. You've not, you know, you haven't been there. You haven't been doing the work. Um, you know, uh, Senator Warren certainly threw at him, you know, the, the, you know, how he's got people putting together catchphrases, how he's never really been, you know, outside of small town politics. Um, and a number of people hit him for the number of multi-million dollar donors that he has um, donating to his campaign. So, I mean, I, I think he had uh, a good, I would say he's probably in the top three as far as the performances. Um, but, you know, people hit him with some 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 definite uh, issues that I think voters may have challenges with. What I thought was a good line that Bloomberg had at one point, I don't know whether it was afterwards or during, but he said, the winner of this debate is Donald Trump. Like, I right. felt like... I felt like his point of if we want to beat Donald Trump, we cannot stand up here and talk about Medicare for all. We cannot talk about how we need to end capitalism, punish the punish the rich and 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 reward the poor. Like I, I thought that, you know, that was an argument that he should have stuck with because the truth be told. I, I believe that. I think he's right. It's not necessarily where I think where I want the party to be. It's not where I want my vote to be going. But I certainly believe that to beat a guy like Donald Trump right now, you need to have the, 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 the middle of the road voter. You need to have the moderate uh, on your side. And the Democrats during the primaries, it almost was just who could leapfrog and go further left. And, and all that's going to do is drive the moderate voters to Trump. Because I don't believe that most voters in America, and I don't want to say most people, but most voters in America, I don't think that they want free health care for all, um, uh, all people within our borders. I don't believe it's they want that. It's very possible. That. Yeah, well, it's I, very possible you could be correct on that. But you've and, and, and I think you've got a lot of people that are maybe open minded to a slower process in that direction where, you know what, let's get the you know, let's start regulating the uh, private sector more. Let's create like a, a safety blanket for health, which I is really what I thought Obamacare was. I mean, you know, it was, you know what, let's let's you know, let's all chip in a little bit and help the people that absolutely have nothing. Because right. those people it, have a right to get some medical care. Like, it wasn't a huge leapfrog left. I think Bernie Sanders' politics are, um, they're, they're, they're dangerous to some, and they're easily um, uh, mis, misunderstood by others. There are genuinely people in this country who think he's a communist, who grew up in a world where the worst thing you could call someone was a communist or a socialist. And albeit maybe in his social circle, in his world, it's okay to say, yes, I have socialist leanings. There's a heck of a lot of voters out there who think that that's basically saying, I'm a communist. 
Well, and that was I the hate one good line that uh, that Bloomberg got out at him. He's like, you know, he's, he's he said that Sanders is the only socialist he's met that's a millionaire with three homes, mm-hmm. and it's you know it's a valid point. But um, yeah, the the health, the Medicare for all is 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 definitely a touchy subject. I mean, you know, like you said, uh, Obamacare was supposed to be a stopgap for those individuals that couldn't get insurance on their own. So you know, you would think it would be a better plan to rather try and revamp the entire insurance system is to look at the cost of health care and how do we get costs down for people how do we stop you know the prices of prescription drugs in this country being eight to 15 times higher than right. any other country you know i was reading an article the other week about you know, i forget what the particular operation was but it was cheaper for this insurance company to put their patients on a plane and fly them down to mexico and get the treatment done in a, in a clinic in mexico and fly them back than it was to do the entire procedure here in the united states Right. So that's 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 a microcosm of how broken the system is. And I think that if we, and I think one of the problems with introducing the idea of health care for all is that in a and keep in mind, these are very complex plans where, you know, it's just the fact that, you know, people are seeing their medical costs skyrocketing and they're being left with a, a sense of. Am I going to be paying for other people's medical care? Am I, you know, are my costs going to go up so that my neighbor who currently cannot afford health care suddenly has it? And I'm not, I don't want to do that. I'm already paying enough. I mean, I would have to imagine or I would hope that the majority of Americans out there, A, don't think anyone should suffer or die by not having access to proper health care, or B, that families shouldn't have to lose everything and go into bankruptcy to pay for medical care. You would hope a majority of Americans out there support those concepts. I but don't how think do that's we, the Ameri- but that's how not do we the American get there we in a way in, that friend. doesn't, well, I don't know. It's, I and again, like what's what what is challenging is that you know the 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 folks on the right who are against providing universal health care, you know, have managed to you know tap into that anger in a lot of the middle class and a lot of these red states, you know, and and misdirect their anger. You know, should your anger be at someone who's made seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour minimum wage for 15 years and would like to get a bump up to a living wage? You know, should your anger be towards that illegal immigrant that came here trying to make a better life for himself and is taking a job that, frankly, no American wants? Or should your anger be directed at, you know, the millionaires of this country that have pushed politicians into place to give them tax breaks or major corporations that pay nowhere near their fair share of taxes. I think it is um, one of the devices that has been used by the wealthy against the middle class is to place them in a position where they have either the lower class to identify with or the upper class to identify with and not wanting to identify with the poor you have a middle class that identifies with the wealthy. You've got people who are struggling on a month-to-month basis to pay their bills, who are bastardizing, like you said, the minimum wage employee who who requires some sense of assistance from the government to get by, while celebrating a guy night a guy like Jeff Bezos, who is. Um, uh, a multi-billionaire um, with with just a ludicrous amount of money, and is like you said, not doing his fair share in helping the rest of society keep some standard. Right. Well, I mean, you've got people, you know, you've got families of four living in in you know a trailer home, each of them sharing one prescription of insulin while they watch the Kardashians and the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills on TV and think that's a lifestyle to aspire to. For and me. and yeah, and then be like, and then be like, oh, they're gonna take those immigrants are taking away my jobs. Like, no, no one, no one is out, you know, doing the 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 jobs that immigrants come here to do. Like, I think wasn't it? I think it was Stephen Colbert a few years back actually went out and did a migrant farmer's job. I remember for that a day. He, he was he he he, uh, he picked fruit. Yeah, and he was like, he's like, I, he's like, I, I, he's like, I couldn't do it. Yeah. And these folks do that, you know, six or seven days a week for, for years on end. 
Right. And it's it's not and, and and people are middle class is fine going and buying oranges or apples or whatever the produce is for cheap prices because the farms are paying cheap labor to get those into the stores of course. and then bastardize the migrants that give them that luxury. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt that the moment where you could tell that the, the whole argument was bullshit was when you had the um, you had the uh, uh, Trump administration take over and they immediately started talking about how they were going to cut off uh, the uh, temporary work visas and then immediately issued a waiver for the agricultural department. Of course. Where it was just like, no, 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 we don't want we don't want illegals coming into this country and taking our job. Well, except if they're here to pick fruit, then right. Those guys it's okay. Will allow. It's like, it's like, wait a second, wait a second. That's bullshit. Because if you genuinely are against um, uh, people from other countries coming here and taking our job, then it's got to be across the board. Then you've got to say to that person in in Wyoming who's uh, like you said, uh, buying uh, uh, cartons of uh, uh, cigarettes. And uh, bitching about them, eh, no, 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 you can go get a job now. Like, there's a job, go get it. Oh, oh, you, you, you think you're better than working in a like? Go to a slaughterhouse. Who's working in a slaughterhouse now? Sure, it's all immigrants. Not, not, not Americans. No, nobody wants to sit there and, and decapitate cattle and skin them uh, uh, seconds after they've been uh, uh, obliterated. No, nobody wants to do that. That's why, uh, and it, it's the system has failed. It's getting worse. And I, I just feel like this batch of Democrats that are um, that are running, I don't see how they are going to be the influence that's going to make it better. Well, I think you would have to agree that if there is one clear hands down winner last night, it was the makeup artists. Oh, because well, okay. there was more pancake on that stage than at any IHOP in the country. OK, I'm going to say this. I recently got a new television. Okay. I thought that the clarity of the screen was the was what was was what I was seeing. Like my television was was over ten years old. So when I you saw upgraded. Joe Biden, when I saw Joe, I, it was it was time when I saw Joe Biden come up for the first time, and they showed his face, and it was, um, it, it was something worthy of Donald Trump. It, it really was like he definitely had an orange hue to him last night, except around his eyes, which yes. were pale white, which is then that's where you you could see that it was bad makeup. And I just sat there and said, oh, wow, these TVs have really gotten good. And, and Mayor then, Pete needed to shave before that debate because oh, he had really? a little five o'clock stubble going on. Maybe he's trying to appear more manly. Maybe he's trying to say, listen, I may be gay, but I still have testosterone and and I grow facial hair like a big boy. There you go. Could be. I don't know, but um, it really was a fascinating debate. I, I'm glad I watched this one. It, it was definitely the best debate so far, and uh, we'll definitely have to check out the next one whenever it comes up. My question for you is this. I'm not asking you who you will vote for, but if the election were today, which of the Democrat, and obviously you may vote Republican, you could go Donald Trump, you could go, in, you could go to a, uh, a third party. Of the... 12 people that were on the stage yesterday, who would you vote for? Honestly, I would have no issue um, voting for Elizabeth Warren after last night. All right. Okay. She was probably the only person on the stage that gave me a good amount of confidence in their ability to lead the country. You know what? I, I, I agree with you. And my fear is that she cannot beat Donald Trump. Is that it's, there it's are not possible. is that I don't believe and I know this goes back to the Bloomberg argument, which I am trying to shake myself of, which is the fact that I, you know, if it, looking at the group of people that were there, who is the best candidate, who has the best views? It's Warren. But Warren versus Trump, who do I think wins? And I think Trump wins. I think he masters the electoral college, and I th and I think he gets people who sit there and go, I just don't like her, because he. I think he here's where here's where my mind goes is that four years ago we were sitting here saying there is no way Donald Trump beats Hillary Clinton, no way agreed. in hell. You know he's got a puncher's chance. Um, listen, I. <laughs> You know, you've got a lot of people, and, and, and again, as he continues to do things like, you know, these, these presidential pardons, 
um, you know, continuing to con the tariffs that hurt the farmers. I mean, at some point, you know, his 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 firewall has to break, and you know, we'll see if it's if that's going to happen in the next nine months. What do you mean by firewall? Well, I mean he, he you know he has he has these voters that he feels he has locked up that are going to support him regardless of what he does. You know, I mean is his his famous quote of you can go out on Fifth Avenue in New York City and shoot somebody. And if look he what he can't hold that electorate if if those, you know, again, and and it's not even a case of, you know, the the voters that voted for him necessarily switching and voting Democrat. If enough of those people that came out to vote for him that wouldn't normally have voted, if they just stay home because they're sick of the process, you know, it it damages him as well. It damages Trump. Point. Yeah, right. I'm saying if, if they get so disenfranchised with him, like they oh. can't bring themselves to vote for an Elizabeth Warren, but they're just so sick of his bullshit that they're just going to say, you know what, I'm just not even leaving my house come election day. See, I think that this dem that this election gets um, decided by the minority vote. I think that the, no doubt that, about it. No I think that about over the, if you if you look at the last elections that especially 2016 is that if the minorities went out and voted the way they supported candidates Hillary would have won but she didn't connect with them enough that made them come out and vote okay and I'm not I, saying I, you're I, lazy. I don't argue with that point. I'm, I do not want you to misinterpret what I just said is that all minorities are lazy because that's not what I said. What I no, said was... No, I took was, that to mean that you're you're blaming the blacks. No. Uh, in a way, but not for, <laughs> not, for, not, not for the type of reason you are. What I'm saying is just the fact that the if you look at the Republican Party, if you look at their base, it is a, it, it is a shrinking um uh percentage of the total populace is the fact that if you can go out there and get a coalition of different groups that don't necessarily agree with each other but disagree with with um uh one opponent you can win the presidency and i think that is and i think that the mistake that hillary made in 2016 was that she took a lot of those parts of that coalition for granted. And no, she agreed. didn't connect with minorities and assume that they were going to vote for her because minorities vote Democrats. And what happened was a lot of them stayed home. I think she right. sat there and assumed that college students vote Democrat, but she didn't connect with them, after, especially after what she after what she did with Bernie. Like, yeah, who was, no, she turned a lot of people away with that. Who was... Uh-oh. No, oh, no. I'm, no. Not, I'm not opening that door again. Don't worry. Ron. Anyway, um, so not to belabor the point on the debate, but uh, we also had uh, the sentencing of Roger Ooh. Stone today. 40 months he got. Three years, four months. Uh, did he get enough? Too much? Too little? What's your take? Um, I, I was happy to see that the judge uh, ignored the... Uh, uh, the updated uh, sentencing recommendations from uh, Bill Burr, uh, Attorney General. I was happy to see that the judge ignored the uh, tweeting barrage coming from our president. Um, you know, not necessarily going with the eight years, but uh, also not uh, letting uh, Mr. Stone walk away. Uh, I, I like the fact that the judge in his sentencing sat there and made a comment along the lines of uh, the uh, truth still means something. And this man did break the law and therefore should be punished for it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I felt like it, it, it was sort of like a middle of the road verdict. It wasn't one extreme or another. What I, I, I think it'll be interesting to see is whether Donald Trump will pardon Roger Stone. Sure. And... You know, uh, right now, you know, Roger Stone remains a, a free man because he filed a motion for a, a new trial because of some comments that one of the jurors on his previous trial had made. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I think this actually, you know, gives if he gets a new trial, I think it gives, you know, President Trump the luxury of not having to provide yet another presidential pardon of which right. he did many this past week i mean a i think 11 slew um, uh, 11 now, pardons again, uh, to, to be fair 
he is nowhere near the number of pardons that um, other presidents have given. I think he's done 26 pardons in three and a half years, Mm -hmm. and other presidents have certainly uh, done more. Um, You know, I guess in looking at some of these pardons, some of them don't make sense. You know, um, and even some of them, you look at uh, what's the guy from uh, from Chicago there, Rod Blaganovich. Blaganovich. Um, all of the Illinois GOP said, "Don't pardon this guy. Like he literally is part of the corruption you say you're trying to get rid of, and he commutes his sentence and pardons him." But what do most of these people have in common is the fact that they have all made the argument of, "I did not do anything wrong." My actions were misunderstood, and I have been persecuted by the Department of Justice. Like Blag, Blag, like uh, I, I'm going to uh, Blagodovich. Yes, that sounds about right. His argument was: I was caught on tape saying that this was too good of a opportunity for me to give away free. But right. nowhere got a, got was a there a golden opportunity here, and I'm not going to fucking give it away for free. And nowhere was there any evidence that he received anything in return for uh, a Senate nomination. Now, basically, just for those listeners that forgot, uh, uh, Rod Blago, I, I'm not even going to you know, uh, give his butcher his name again, but he was the governor of Illinois when Barack Obama gave up his Senate seat for Um, so that he could focus on his presidential campaign. Now, uh, the law states that, you know, in an instance where a senator vacates his seat, the governor nominates someone. Now, the Illinois governor here was caught on audio by a FBI investigation uh, declaring that he was going to trade this nomination for a Senate seat for some type of... uh, um, uh, exchange of either uh, monetary gains or, or some type of service. Now, nowhere was he ever um, caught on tape actually in the process of those negotiations. Nowhere is it shown that he received anything in return. So his argument has always been, you recorded me in a conversation where I was talking out of my ass. I never committed any crime. I have. I should not be in jail. And And, and from Donald Trump's logic... He's absolutely right. Here's a man that was railroaded by the FBI and was punished for something he never did. Well, and one thing that's that's interesting is it, one one theme, two themes, I should say. It seems to be one or the other with these pardons. Either the people that were pardoned had family members that donated money to the Trump campaign. What? Or, yeah. What? Or he pardoned people that were convicted by the Department of Justice when it was led by Democrats? Um, I think that it has always been the case that if you are buddies or you have family members or friends who are buddies with the president, um, you will get off. I, I think the, uh, was it Buddy Rich the uh, that uh, the Clinton drummer? got off? Yeah, Buddy Rich. <laughs> yes, Buddy Rich was a, uh, again, and this is not to say that Bill Clinton didn't do this, that Barack Obama didn't do this. I mean, this is not Everybody something does that you it. can point at, at President Trump and say, you know, but for President Trump to be the one who's saying, I'm working to fight corruption, and that was his big defense against his impeachment over the whole Ukraine deal is, I'm fighting corruption in other countries, but I'm uh, apparently condoning corruption in the United States is what the message the, these pardons kind of sent to some people. And this is where this guy has balls, is the fact that he's declaring that these people didn't do anything wrong, that he has created such a cult of personality in the in his supporting base that if he sits there and says, Rod Bogdanovich did nothing wrong, his followers will sit there and say, yeah, the FBI railroaded this guy. He did nothing wrong. Well, it's going to be, uh, again, an interesting year ahead of us leading up to the election. We have to see what else, who else is going to pardon, what else he's going to try and get away with. And this is the part that scares me, is the fact that usually presidents wait until after the election 
for right. uh, 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 you know where where they're no longer going to be held accountable for their pardons. Usually, pardons take place on you know in, in the last month of somebody's presidency. Here's a guy who is seven months away from a general election who is so brazenly pardoning criminals. People who have been uh, uh, convicted, it's it's as if he is setting the he is sending a message of simply because you are convicted in a criminal case, I don't think you're guilty, and therefore you should be you 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 should be free. Like he, it's he, like he, he fears no sense of repercussions whatsoever from any of his actions anymore. Well, and he continuously pisses off the courts, and but yet then goes to the courts because he has to get things done, and then is is shocked when the courts don't support him because he flaunts the rule of law so much. Yes, and then he sits there and tells his people that the court system is broken. It's as oh, yeah. if he is he has sat there and generated this um, this this overall dialogue that he is the only voice of reason and everything else is madness. We should disregard it and break it. it this is as close as we've gotten to a um, a wannabe dictator in my lifetime. No question about it. He has no respect for the separation of the different branches of government. He has no respect for the fact that there should be any checks um, uh, and balance on his power. And what I've seen over the past four years is that there hasn't been. Um, uh, the, the, the Congress has bent over backwards for him, and the courts are, uh, for the most part, afraid to take him on. Yep. Let's put, uh, let's put that subject to rest, as well as all of the celebrities we lost this oh. past week. Um, it, was, it was another rough week, Brian. Uh, a number of celebrity deaths. None in the death pool, though. Uh, we've only still had um, two deaths in the death pool, David Stern and Kirk Douglas. Um, but uh, we, uh, we are waiting to see who else might pass away in the death pool. But in the meantime, novelist Charles Portis, uh, best known for his bestseller, True Grit, died at the age of 86. Um, fan, of, uh, fan of Portis, were you, Brian? Um, I'm going to say that some of my favorite memories of high school was uh, sitting on the uh, number seven train coming from Queens into Manhattan. Uh, you know, the uh, hour and a half where uh, I got to uh, sit on the subway uh, with my uh, Walkman listening to a uh, Sony disc uh, that was playing and uh, being able to read, uh, you know, I read True Grit, you know, when I was a, uh, a freshman in uh, high school. But I mean, there were so many other pieces of fiction that he put out. I mean, Norwood, Dog of the South, Masters of Atlantis, my personal favorite of his, um, a collection of some of his shorter work, um, Escape Velocity. I think I read that twice senior year. You are nothing if not a scholar. And a liar. Yes. <laughs> also uh passing away this week this one hurt uh larry tesler oh. a lot of you may not know uh but he worked with a gentleman by the name of tim mott uh, to create a word processor called gypsy uh, and what gypsy is best known for is coining the turns cut copy and paste we would not have those things today if it weren't for larry tesler so uh they will be uh, obviously cutting and pasting him into a grave sometime soon so uh, rest in peace, Larry. We will miss you. Big ups. And also, speaking of big ups, uh, actress Janae Dubois passed away. Which I didn't realize uh, she was in the show, but she also sang this intro song to Good Times. Oh, I uh, know. I thought she wrote the song to the Jeffersons. Um, was it the Jeffersons? Am I yes, confused? She sang, you may have to correct me here. Ron, not all black women sing the same. Um, she um, she starred in Good Times, but sang the theme song to the Jeffersons. Oh well, then I was I was confused. Well, thank yes. you for correcting me. But she passed away at what age? Uh, she was seventy four, but public records indicate she may be older. Okay. Um, One and thing she was, I always yes not not to not to. Uh, you know, push her aside, her passing. But the one thing I always remember when I hear the Good Times theme is on the Chappelle show when they did the contest uh, to see, you know, who knew most about, like, African-American history and trying to identify the lines in Good Times and hanging in a chow line was the one that everybody got hung up on. And no one knew that. Hanging in a chow line, Good Times. Uh, 
I, I honestly I think that um, that may have been at least uh, in terms of the way it resonated. That was probably the best television show of my lifetime. I, I would agree with you on that. Uh, but anyway, passed away, uh, like you said, at 74, was on Good Times from 74 to 79. Um, so rest in peace, Janet Dubois. And finally, and I, I know this one uh, hurts you more than the rest, Brian, Cy Sperling, the founder of the Hair Club for Men. I'm Cy yeah. Sperling, president of Hair Club for Men. And remember, I'm not only the Hair Club president, but I'm also a client. Passing away in Florida uh, today at the age of 78. Now, I grew up in the 80s when uh, his commercials for the Hair Club for Men were plastered on television. And he always had that lazy Queens Long Island accent where he kind of like mumbled some of his words. But his whole thing was, we are going to use your hair to grow hair. And, uh, you know, uh, the before and after photos... Um, you know, for uh, of people who had uh, grown frustrated with toupees um, and were looking to uh, grow the kind of hair where they could, uh, you know, actually live life, uh, you know, to its fullest. Um, he gave a lot of men hope in a time when being bald was unacceptable. Cy Sperling, we all thought you were dead. Apparently not passing away at the age of 78 uh, in Florida. Like I said, Florida, a great place for old people to die. And uh, at, at its height, Hair Club for Men was bringing in $100 million annually, and then he sold the business in 2000 for $45 million. So not a, not a bad lifestyle for him. How do you know how tall he was? Um, I don't. Well, you just said in his height. <laughs> You're out of control. Thank you. You, you little stinker. Um, all right. Well, people really seem to respond to this new uh, little bit we did last week called What Are You Watching? So, Brian, this past week, what are you watching? I started the second season of Narcos Mexico on Netflix. Really? How I, I could never get into that show. How is it? Oh, my God. Hold on a second. You've not. You Are we talking Narcos or Narcos Mexico? Uh, well, just Narcos. Okay. First off, is it the is it the <laughs> subtitles? Is it okay. your 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 borderline hatred of Hispanics? Like, what is it about Narcos that is it is it your um, cocaine addiction when you're in your mid th- uh, mid twenties? Like, that might what, have something uh, to do with it. So the whole idea of Narcos is the first season. It is the rise of Pablo Escobar. Correct. Second season, the fall of Pablo Escobar. Third season is we shift to the Cali cartel. We started Medellin, and then we go to Cali. And then after that, it's like, all right, maybe I think we've spent too much time in Colombia. Now let's go and watch the rise of the Mexican cartel, which in many ways we are we are addressing now, we are dealing with as Mexico seems to have taken the forefront in the brutal violence of the drug trade. Um, where was it that it didn't resonate with you? You know, I just, uh, I just, I, don't, I couldn't put a finger on it, but it just wasn't something. I, I watched it, and I just didn't find it interesting. How much of it did you watch? I probably got through two or three episodes. Do me a favor. Try it again. It right, is it's what I one of my favorite television shows of the past few years. All right. If you're saying it, uh, I will give it another. I try. love it. I absolutely love it. First off, I'm a sucker for anything about the drug trade. Always have. I also like the fact that it takes place in the 80s. So there are, um, uh, you know, it, it, it feels like, uh, you know, a, a, a callback to, a, to an age when I was much happier in my life. And, um, and it's also really well done. All right. I will give it one more shot. Um, so I watched a few things this week. Um, first off, I watched the movie Parasite. Uh, which obviously, as we know, really cleaned up at the Ask Oscars this past year. Um, I liked it. I, I don't know that I necessarily agree with it being the best movie of the year, but I thought it was very well done. I heard that it was a really good movie. It, 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 it's different than what you expect it to be, but it was, it was very entertaining. Um, the, the ending, I, I kind of have issue with, but I think overall, uh, if you like film, it's a great piece of cinema. Uh, cinema. Just to show you how little I am exposed to what's going on in cinema today, 
I genuinely thought that the movie was a horror movie about an alien. <laughs> well, you're you're a little off, but I would encourage you to see it anyway. And oh, this weekend I was talking to a friend of mine and who had seen Parasite and walked me through the story, and I sat there and said, I want to watch this movie. Yeah, it's a very interesting story. It's very well done, very well acted, beautiful cinematography. You can definitely see why it won a lot of awards. Um, I also watched uh, the first four episodes of the Star Trek Picard series, um, which, again, I was a very casual fan of Star Trek Next Generation, but this is very well done. Even if you okay. are, if I'll put it this way, you don't need to like Star Trek. You just need to like Patrick Stewart and good TV shows. And I now think this is on Disney this. Plus. This that is, on is Disney actually Plus? on CBS Access. And you're paying for that. Um, I can't comment on that either way. How I may have received these episodes, but I will highly recommend Star Trek Picard. And then also on Amazon Prime, I watched the first two episodes of Ted Bundy falling for a killer. Ooh, how was that? I heard um, good things about it. I'm I'm really enjoying it, and I what I what I like about it, and and this was their intent. They they tell you this in in the beginning of the first episode is everything you see about the Ted Bundy story focuses on Ted Bundy and doesn't right. focus on the victims. And while obviously, yes, you need to tell the story of Ted Bundy in these shows, it also goes into the story of the women he killed and, and mm. the, the lives he affected. And it also really speaks to the, you know, how women were portrayed in society at this time that he was committing those murders. So it really helps put everything into a very historical perspective as well. So interesting. Um, very well done. I highly recommend it. All right. I like it. I am paying for my Amazon Prime membership. I will go out there and say that. Now, my question to you is, are you are you paying for Amazon Prime for the video benefits of it or because you like free next day delivery? I mean, I like the whole package. I get the free next day delivery. I get the Amazon Prime and I get the Amazon Music on all of my Alexa devices. Okay. And I even subscribe to Kindle Unlimited, so now I can I can read Unlimited on my Kindle app too. Allegedly, you're not a big reader. It's just something I heard uh, you know, from you know people that live with you. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm trying to get back into it. All right. Okay. Anything else for this episode? I mean, we've really burned through a lot of time here. Um, we would like to thank our special guest, um, Senator Elizabeth Warren. She was a little rough on us, but. We appreciate her stopping by anyway. Uh, make sure you check out our Facebook page for the upcoming Drink of the Week poll. As always, go to ronandbrianpodcast.com for all things Ron and Brian. And you can also subscribe to our Patreon there in the upper right-hand corner of our homepage. Perhaps if we got more subscribers, we'd have better impressions. Just throwing that out there. Brian, anything else you got for us this week? Nah, other than the fact that I absolutely love you, I love doing this once a week with you, and I can't wait to do a Patreon episode with you. All right, love you too, my friend. Let's head over to Patreon land.